New Litter Green, the patented cat box filler with natural chlorophyll, controls odor, and absorbs like a sponge. I'm, I'm allowing a decent interval to pass so we can now talk. Um, well, I guess the, the immigration issue was the thing, as you know, that uh, changed your life and, and made your name probably better known throughout the world than it had been before that. And when you made a speech, as a result of which you were called a racist by um, many of your own papers and uh, many in the States who reported it. And it's easy to see reading the speech uh, why you could be called that. Do, do, do you understand why people call you a racist? Uh, it is one of the modern terms of abuse. Mm -hmm. And the term of abuse is the more effective, the less defined it is. Then you can throw it at anybody and anything. Uh, but I find this word race very irrelevant in the British context. Indeed, it's rather a word which we've borrowed from America because in the States, uh, the term race simply means Negro or non-Negro. Now, uh, that, of course, is the form in which this sort of conflict or potential conflict primarily presents itself in the United States. But that's a very different background, a very different origin uh, from the problem which we have here. I, I wonder if you'd uh, uh, allow me a minute or two to sketch in the background here sure. in Britain, because it is unique in the world, and one gets it wrong if one imports ideas from anywhere else. Mm -hmm. You've got to go back to the fact that, alone of all the countries in the world, we never had a definition of ourselves. There was never such a thing as a, a United Kingdom citizen. Unlike the United States, which has its own citizenship, France, Germany, we never had that. Uh, we were British subjects. We were subjects of the king or the queen, as the case might be. Consequently, as the British dominions expanded, automatically, everybody was born in or belonged to any part of the British dominions, hundreds of millions of human beings, were all British subjects. And in the law of this country, there was never any distinction between one British subject and another. There was no way of labeling the British subject who, if I may use the word, belonged to this country. Now, this was, um, had many advantages uh, when Britain was the center of an empire. Uh, and if the numbers from the rest of the empire who availed themselves of this identification remained small, uh, then no problem arose. But the rest of the empire, had its own citizenships. Uh, an Englishman wasn't allowed to go and settle in, in India or Jamaica. On the contrary, uh, they had their own very strict uh, demarcations and definitions. And now, after the Second World War, there was a big technical revolution that took place, uh, and that was air travel, which made the movement of masses of people from one continent to another, possible on a scale which had never been contemplated before. As a result of that, there moved into the United Kingdom growing numbers of British subjects uh, from the rest of the, well, it was by now the Commonwealth, it had ceased to be the Empire, who had no other connection than that with this country with the United Kingdom. Now, it wasn't that this was asked for. It wasn't that these people were brought in uh, as labor, like the movement of labor on the continent. It happened because without a major change in our law, it couldn't be prevented. Indeed, it couldn't be seen. You see, we actually don't know how many came in, because if they're all British subjects, you only counted, well, you didn't count British subjects. Uh, and uh, a Hong Kong Chinese, or a Pathan from the Northwest Frontier, or myself coming back from a weekend in Paris, we were all the same going through the port of entry or Heathrow Airport. Well, eventually, reality breaks through. And in 1962, at last, uh, the law was changed so as to make a difference between the British subjects who belong to this country and those who don't. But by the time that that had happened, uh, I'm simplifying, mm -hmm. so large a number had already settled here, plus the inflow in the years after 1962, for reasons which I won't enter into, uh, they are complicated, that we now know that unless some drastic change happens, 
large parts of many of our cities will, by the beginning of the next century, be occupied by a population which has nothing in common with the people of this country. Now, I've defined mm -hmm. the problem. Yes. <clears throat> that, that all sounds reasonable. I think the... Uh... It is reasonable, you mean. Well... <laughs> it also sounds reasonable. Uh, the thing is that I think in reading the speech, it's obvious that um, many of the examples that you chose to illustrate the problem uh, were much ah. more pungent, if ah, you'll yes. pardon the expression. I ah, mean, yes. you talked about a lady in a small town yes, who had excrement now, shoved yes, through her letterbox right. by now we black must, people. Now, we must sort of here have the context and, uh, to that speech. Yeah. That speech was made two, three days before the conservative opposition had decided to oppose a race relations bill. And the reason that we were going to oppose it was that it would do more harm than good. And it would do more harm than good because the danger to race relations, basically, was the fear of the indigenous population, mm -hmm. of the growing numbers and growing influx of immigrants. And it was that fear which was the reason why that bill we believed, and all believed, mm -hmm. would do more harm than good. That, as the member representing one of the places primarily affected, I set out to illustrate and to explain to parts of a country that had no knowledge of it mm -hmm. in that speech. So that's the context of that speech. I was making that speech mm -hmm. against a bill which the Conservative Party as a whole opposed. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, mm -hmm. you know, it, it isn't really the danger li lies not so much in discrimination against the immigrant. It lies in the fear which increasing numbers inspire in the minds, and not surprisingly, and not unnaturally, of the population here. Mm -hmm. That was the message. But do you still have any question in your mind as to what in the speech caused such manifestations afterwards as uh, if you want a nigger yes. for a neighbor, vote no, no, labor? No, no, no. That, that phrase, that like that phrase that was used speech. long before. It was never used in connection with my speech. Mm -hmm. That phrase dates back to the 1964 election, <laughs> if not earlier. Yes. Uh, but of course, there was a terrific explosion mm -hmm. of relief that at last somebody had drawn attention, not we now know to the full dimensions, for I underestimated the numbers in that speech, but at any rate to what were then thought to be the full dimensions of the problem. And people who had watched year after year, particularly in the areas concerned, something happening which was altering their lives, but nobody apparently caring, nobody referring to it. Nobody worrying about it. Perhaps Said, we can find... But at last, at least, somebody's spoken about it. Now we can face it. <laughs>